Hello, everybody, and welcome to my office, which is also my living room. It's the boardroom where we have meetings. In fact, I've got a great staff restaurant over here. It's over there in my kitchen through that door. They even put on staff accommodation in this office. It's my bedroom upstairs. Yeah, that speaks for us all, doesn't it? Working from home. Well, not maybe not all of us, and we are going to get into that. We can't just assume that everybody has converted their living room into their office, spending all day on Zoom, as indeed I am but many of us have. So we're going to explore the future of work and what this ongoing pandemic, what this crisis has meant for the way that we work now and how that's going to shape the way that so many of us work in the future. So hello, good evening, thanks for being here. My name is Gareth and I'm your friendly host for tonight. So I'm one of the lecturers in the Science Communication Group here at Imperial College. So we run a Science Communication MSc and I also do radio programmes at the BBC about science on the radio, not TV. I'm better on radio, really. <laughs> so anyway, enough about me. We're going to meet our panel in a minute, but this is really a timely opportunity to think about home working and the future of work. If you look at the news, um, Zoom reported its uh, second quarter results just uh, this morning. Revenues up 355%, um, second quarter profits have more than doubled. So Zoom and many of those other online platforms are having a great crisis, as indeed the high street and tourism uh, industries, many of them really suffer. So there's a lot to get into today. Just before we do jump into it, a quick reminder that this is part of Imperial's late online series. So these are week long celebrations of research at Imperial College and they happen at the end of the month and they will continue happening at the end of the month for the rest of the year. And this is one of them. This is part of this uh, week where we're looking in this case this evening at the future of work. And I'm going to stop rambling in a minute and get some of your questions on. So thank you for being there. If you're watching us live on YouTube, if you have any questions, then just type them into the comments section and they'll get forwarded on to the console in front of me, my laptop, basically. I was just trying to make it sound fancy. Um, but yeah, really do please fire some questions at us. Uh, and a few of you have managed to post some questions in advance. We've already got plenty to get into, but we really want to get your questions on here. Um, it goes without saying, just a little bit of housekeeping, just keep the questions and any comments you put up nice and respectful. We're all friendly here. Let's make it nice. So uh, no trolling, please. Otherwise, we'll just boot you off. <laughs> Simple. Um, and I should just point out that this event is being recorded. And that's great. So it means that uh, if you want to go back and watch it again, and we reckon quite a few people go back and watch them the second time, because you often pick things up when you watch the playback that you didn't get the first time. So it is being recorded. And if you're watching the recording, well, I was going to say you missed a great evening, but you haven't because you're here. So I think that's pretty much all I need to tell you just to get things going. Uh, so let's jump in and meet our experts this evening. So we're going to start with Rajesh Bhargave, who's Associate Professor of Marketing at Imperial College Business School. And um, first question to you, Rajesh, is how do you think the world of work is going to look different or the same, say, in 10 years time? Well, first of all, Garrett, thanks for having me here and for this discussion, which I think is extremely important right now to think about what's changing in the immediate future, but also for the long term, let's say in 10 years. Uh, now, I think that there's no aspect that's going to be completely disappearing in 10 years necessarily that I can think of. But there's a lot of things that will change, at least fractionally, uh, reduced to some extent. And one of those very important things is just this idea of set hours and schedules. Instead, I think we're moving more, much more towards flexibility in terms of the timing. And that has an effect on everything from our transportation to our consumer behavior, which is my area of interest, uh, but also to work productivity itself. Right. So it's time up for the five to nine or the nine to five. In fact, it could be five to nine. The hours are all upside down and inside out. Really interesting thing to get into there. Well, also this evening, say hello to Pelin Demerol, Senior Lecturer in Innovation and Enterprise at the Dyson School of Design and Engineering at Imperial. And uh, Pelin, well, what about you then? How are things going to change over the next 10 years, do you think? Hi, good evening, Gareth. Well, I think we'll see quite a lot of the carbon intensive uh, work practices slowly going away. They may not fully disappear, but we'll see things like commutes getting shorter, uh, business trips, particularly overseas business trips, going uh, uh, becoming less frequent. Uh, because this period is interesting uh, with the pandemic, we have seen uh, some of these movements uh, really speed up. Uh, but hopefully uh, 
some of these good things will remain and we'll see much more environmental practices at our works that will also cover things like um, what our offices look like, how energy efficient they will be, how often we will be there, how often we will be commuting there and so on. Okay, thank you for that. And our third expert is Anna Taval, Associate Professor of Technology and Innovation Management at uh, the Imperial Business School. So over to you, Anna. Think of something the other two haven't said so far and tell us how you think things are going to be different over the next 10 years. Oh, Anna, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> oh, hello, everyone. And thank you, Gareth, for... Uh, uh, the interesting question. What I was going to say is actually quite uh, similar, perhaps, to what uh, the previous two speakers have said. But what I was, what I think is really going to change in the next ten years, is the expectation to be simply there, to be simply in the office. I think in the past we've taken it so much for granted that we go uh, to work to do our work, and um, I think if anything, um, the pandemic has opened our eyes that we can trust our employees to do their work even if they're not there. Yeah. And so this has uh, empowered us to uh, in indeed embody or embrace a more uh, flexible approach to work. OK, and let's get into that because it is, I mean, it's lovely, obviously, that employees are trusted enough to get their work done um, when they're working from home. and They don't get too distracted with things. But I mean, do we know why that is? Is it just employees? Are, you know, we're all great people and we work hard and we care about our jobs. Or is it maybe in the home environment where we don't, we're not exhausted from having a long commute? Yeah, we just do some of our best work and we can do it whenever we want. Well, I think the real uh, challenge when working from home is to get the balance right. And so I think uh, what we've been experimenting with over the past few months uh, is that we've been doing pretty much everything, many of us at least, have been doing pretty much everything from home. And I think it starts to become clearer and clearer that some things lend themselves very well to be done at home, uh, whilst others are much more difficult to be done at home. And, uh, and, and I'll be talking yeah, about that it brings much us, more yeah. thankful brings us to one of your big research interests, which is indeed the lack of the physical engagement then. And um, there, it doesn't seem, from what I've seen anyway, that there's a, a killer app that will somehow replace that chance encounter at the desk next to you or uh, in the elevator or whatever. So we just can't replace that or haven't so far. Yeah, so um, I think we've heard a lot, uh, the term, the water cooler uh, chat. And so the yeah. chat that you'd have with your colleague uh, well, when making a cup of tea. Um, and actually, it is quite difficult to really grasp well, why is that so important? Isn't that just, well, having a good time, having a chat with a colleague? Uh, but in the end, how much does it really matter? Well, um, my research shows that for processes of creativity and innovation, which are essential to a very broad range of jobs, these are actually very important. Because when we tend to have uh, online communications, they're more purposeful. Um, they, have a typically a given purpose that is center stage to the conversation. They are typically with people that we already know, whereas the water cooler moment tend to be the opposite of that. They tend to be with people that you perhaps wouldn't necessarily call online, that you wouldn't be in a meeting with online. And you talk about all kinds of random stuff that uh, provides inspiration, um, think, makes you think about how to solve a problem differently. And I think that's what we're going to miss much more if we work too much online. And so we still haven't we haven't found a way of maybe we never will of um, duplicating that uh, that chance encounter in our workspaces. So Rajesh, let's come back to you then. And um, so we're seeing this demise in a way of the nine to five culture. And I just wonder to what extent we are now navigating as individuals different personas and especially when we're at home you've got your being at home persona which may well be looking after the kids and what have you then you might have your consumer persona you're online doing all your shopping and and then your work persona in the zoom meeting or the teams meeting with uh, colleagues i just wonder if these boundaries between our different personas are being blurred and if that's a good thing or a problematic thing I think that's a very important question for many people who are struggling with this issue is um, how to keep these different personas separate. And uh, some people are able to navigate that quite well. The challenge is you have people who, uh, workers who are not accustomed to this work from home remote setup and who are suddenly uh, having to do this in the last few months without the training or the, the background knowledge of 
of how we can keep those different spheres of life separated. It is a challenge because the distractions just um, increase if you're at home, where you have all the things that you consume, television, internet, food. These have been real uh, uh, guilty pleasures for people while they're working from home. Uh, and at the work environment, that clearly separates it for many people psychologically. Uh, and when we think about consumer behavior, people's behavior changes depending on what environment they're in, whether they're focused on productivity or focused on consumption. Uh, so having the work being one space for all that, it's possible, uh, but it's not necessarily for everyone and not everyone is ready for it just yet. Yeah, I know. Since we during my working day, I can have a, a Zoom conference open on one browser window and an online shopping <laughs> uh, window open on a, another browser. And you both being the consumer, you're both kind of earning the money and spending the money at the same time, I suppose, in my <laughs> case. <laughs> um, and I'm, really, I'm delighted to say we've already got some questions coming in. So keep those coming in. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, just go into the comments section. We will look at the questions. They are being moderated, just so you know. Uh, but if you've got a good question it's going to end up in front of me on this screen so keep those questions coming in and we'll go to those but not before we just go back to Pellin quickly to maybe pick up on a point that Anna said which I thought was rather good news that um that as workers we're being trusted to get our work done at home despite all the distractions but your research is interested in the other side of that coin isn't it a creeping surveillance culture coming into home working gig economy working freelance working that maybe is a bit less um, less sound, a bit less savoury? Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. And uh, my findings align with Anne's uh, findings in the way that people who come on to crowd employment platforms for gig work, a lot of the time when we speak to them, they tell us they are there to find meaningful work. And meaningful work for a lot of people is about having autonomy of how what they do, how much work they do when they work and things like that they want to be creative they want to uh, they want to do work that impacts others in positive ways so they're looking for meaningful work but oftentimes what they find on these digital platforms is surveillance technologies uh, keeping tabs on exactly what they are doing so it's uh, it's not for everyone for uh, for some people, this kind of work is great, works really well. Uh, and as Regis said, um, I think flexibility is something people are craving and a lot of people are able to find it uh, on, in freelance work in general, but also on uh, platform uh, work platforms. At the same time, we do see quite a lot of people stuck uh, due to these uh, built-in surveillance systems, which can be as subtle as uh, ratings and reviews on work platforms. Uh, and it really does control people. Yeah, so a lot of freelancers, for instance, get reviews that comment on how quickly they reply to emails or how likely they are to be online at four o'clock in the morning or something like that. And that's exactly that's hugely right. That'd be really stressful for people. Work so can be nonstop for a lot mm. of freelancers, particularly if they are on uh, these global digital platforms because uh, employers or clients are from all over the world. So people are working 24 hours responding to different time zones, mm. uh, but also demands of clients uh, are such that one needs to respond to them right away if you don't want to get lower ratings and if you don't want to get um if you don't want to get lose that job if you want to get a job you need to respond within an hour in most cases is what we are hearing from freelancers yeah yeah and i mean that's that's hugely worrying i, I just think it'd be unbearable to just be feeling that almost everything you did every minute of every day has been surveilled in some way mm. and affects your livelihood your ability to put food on your family's table exactly um, and takes away from meaningful work yeah Okay. Uh, so, as I say, questions coming in. I'm going to stay with you, Pellin, for this one. It's a bit outside the scope of this discussion, mm -hmm. but I think in the past you've looked at the environmental aspects of working life. So you may have an answer. Don't worry if not. But Andrea says, um, if we all work from home, doesn't heating efficiency from personal homes get worse? Um, so is working from home positive from a carbon balance? So I guess that the implication of the question is there, if you're staying in your home longer, you're having to heat that home just for yourself, 
Whereas yeah. maybe in a workplace with several hundred people, you, they, you know, you get diminishing marginal costs in a way to heating. Um, but then on the other hand, is that offset because we're commuting less? So I, I don't, maybe it's too early to have too much literature on this. But what can you tell us about the environmental woes mm -hmm. or good sides of this trend for working from home? So coincidentally, I also study sustainability in uh, construction sector. And uh, UK's homes are appall uh, appalling in terms yeah. of how badly they are insulated. So we got to get our homes insulated. And this, uh, this, is, this is a must. And I think uh, this period can only be a driver for it. So if our homes are insulated and if we are living in our homes as with our families, I think that will be a, a positive balance, cutting commutes and living in insulated homes. But that that is a big caveat there. Yeah, and of course the government now talking about giving us home uh, grants for our homes to improve the uh, the energy efficiency. Uh, and another question's come in, uh, so I'm going to put that to you, Anna. Actually, uh, this is from uh, Rushab, uh, who asks: Has research shown that commuting has any benefits similar to the water cooler moment or otherwise. So what do we know about the, those little bits of bonding, those chance encounters, maybe when you meet a friend of yours on the train or the tube or the bus on the way into work, and we're not getting those anymore. What do we know about that before we even get to the office? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, uh, Rishab. Um, I think uh, of course, with a London focus, yes, uh, many of us, or most of us probably do travel um, to work by public transport. In many other parts of the world, people go in their individual cars, in which, of course, uh, none of this uh, potentially would apply. Um, I think commuting is probably not the best way for these sort of serendipitous, uh, spontaneous exchanges. I think uh, the, why we call it the water cooler moment, uh, I think uh, the key to um, the water cooler effect is finding when people are available. And in particular, if you would like to have five or 10 seconds of a person who is perhaps much more senior to, to you, who is very uh, busy potentially, we have this very good ability to just approach them in the 10 seconds in which they move from one meeting to another. And we can ask them something. We can um, oh, at least get some of, some of their attention and uh, perhaps uh, take advantage from that. That is almost impossible to replicate online. And of course, the burden uh, or the most people would be very hesitant to try and approach a person they see as more senior um, that is quite busy in an online environment in which it's much more nebulous um, to do that. Of course, commuting um, has some advantages because uh, sometimes when we walk with a colleague uh, to get out of the office, we, we walk part of the same way. Uh, we get to talk about all kinds of uh, well, perhaps work related and not work related stuff. I think these are all um, the is the oil basically in our uh, in the social fabric of our work uh, so yes commuting does certainly play a role um even in these sort of serendipitous exchanges yeah and maybe it just helps to make that transition we were talking there rajesh about personas weren't we you know perhaps mm -hmm. it becomes a bit more straightforward is when you've got that bit of time between home and the workplace to take on more the work professional persona and leave the domestic one at home Yes, so uh, going beyond just the potential to have these run-ins during the commute, uh, you can see there's a lot of research on this idea of separation that happens with the commute into work and the commute home. Uh, and when you look at people's preferences all over the world, there's a preference for some commute time overall, whether it's by walking or public transport or cycling, 30 minutes seems to be a, a kind of a, a perfect number for many people all over the world, despite whatever their mode of transport is. Uh, that being said, it's not so much the value of the commute, which can be quite stressful. When you look at uh, the effects on well-being, commute time is one of the worst. If you have a, a crowded train or you have to uh, drive through traffic, uh, but it's more about this idea, if we can have some easy commute, then it helps with that separation and it helps with the overall workflow once you get to work. Okay, now whilst we're talking, I'm going to give you this question from Gaia. This is one of the questions that came in in advance, which is asking about the social responsibility here. And um, the question is, is there a social responsibility uh, or one to the economy, uh, an economic responsibility, to have at least some office presence uh, such that the hospitality industry and similar 
do not suffer? And I suppose it's a double pronged question in, in that, of course, the hospitality industry relies on people like us going into our workplaces. And you can see that, you know, pret a for instance, is laying people off because people aren't going into their um, sandwich shops as much as they mm -hmm. were. But I just wonder also maybe a kind of solidarity thing as well. I, I mentioned in the introduction that we can't assume that everybody can sit at home having Zoom conferences. There's a huge chunk of the economy where people are doing jobs that require you to be physically in a place. So it's a kind of double pronged question. But I wonder, Rajesh, if we can just unpack that a bit with you. Yeah, so I think that has several layers to it, which is what responsibility we have as workers, as managers, as governments. Uh, to think about this very issue. Uh, ultimately, everyone is going with their own incentive here. And if you are going to work and and you feel that you want to visit a local shop, uh, then you should. And I think maybe some people will feel that extra responsibility that if I'm going into work, maybe I should visit that local corner shop and, and buy a sandwich there or coffee. Um, that being said, when you think about how organizations are going to act, I can't imagine that they're going to think of that carefully about the knock-on effect for consumer behavior. It's much more important when we think about city planning and thinking about how we use space to allow for those businesses to continue to thrive, because it is a real issue uh, for a lot of uh, high street stores and, and hospitality sector are struggling and are expecting further declines, especially if they're located in mm. city centers, like in central London. Yeah, okay. And Anna Tavol, I just wonder if you have anything to add to that or maybe the, the previous point. Well, um, I wanted to touch on something that uh, Rajesh mentioned, mentioned earlier in terms of the separation. And so one thing that commuting does is it separates our work and our uh, private lives in, in some way. And of course, this has a lot of potential ramifications for our well-being and so forth. Um, but closer to my research, it also has an effect on creativity. And so, um, as I said earlier, in a lot of jobs, uh, creativity is important. A creativity is uh, pretty much required any time we face a problem, whether it's where you're working in HR, uh, whether you're a lawyer uh, or you're an R&D scientist, an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter. We all encounter problems in our work and creativity is important. And there's this distance from your work that you create by being at home and uh, being at work that really um, aids the creative process. And so the negative way of looking at it is we call it procrastination. Right? So if you're not doing something for a moment, you let your thoughts just wander. And we tend to see this as a negative thing, but when it comes to problem solving and creativity, it is actually really important not to be always fully focused. In particular, if your work and uh, private lives really blend into each other, that separation is coming really difficult, uh, which may have negative effects on your uh, creative work output. Mm. And speaking of those effects, negative or positive, uh, Pelin, this question came in in advance from Shania, who asks about the psychological effects here of working from home, maybe between different age groups or salary groups. Do we know anything about that? Do, do younger people versus older people do better or worse when it comes to maybe some of the more isolated aspects of uh, online working? Um, so I can speak uh, for the self-employed, the freelancers that I have worked with. Uh, so we see quite distinct classes in terms of the pay. So the lower pay, the medium pay, and the high paid, uh, high paid uh, freelancers actually experience very different experiences, uh, even though they are on the same platform. So it's in some ways no different than a regular labor market. So the upper end of the market generally feels very much empowered by being able to work from wherever they like and living the dream of a freelancer, doing what they like. Uh, a lot of them have reported sky being the ceiling. That is a very different experience from those uh, who are kind of in medium pay ranges, oftentimes located in the global north, uh, where living expenses are quite high and their rates are quite low and they feel stuck. They feel on a um, treadmill that they can't get off, working many hours, as we've spoken, uh, through the day and not making enough to pay the bills. And of course, that comes with a lot of uh, negative experiences. Mm, okay. Um, and MS here, I'm wondering which of you wants to take this one. Do we know, will the workers be refunded for heating and electricity bills? It probably depends on the sector and the organisation, but do we know anything about any companies who are going to help out with the broadband costs, for instance? Um, 
or not. It probably depends, doesn't it? Um, so, that, Anna, yeah, you've got your hand up. Well, I, I can say a few things. Um, well, I, I don't think immediately. Uh, what is actually quite interesting is that your employer is legally obliged to provide you a space to work, right? So, I mean, uh, you normally have a desk or at least an open plan desk or something like that. And uh, we're in this very nebulous phase at the moment where essentially your employer is not currently providing that to you because at least for those who are still working from home, uh, you are making your own arrangements. Um, so I, I would say it's very difficult to see how this is going to pan out, but I think um, provided we need move towards a blended future where we have components of online and offline work, uh, I think it would be expected that the employer takes on uh, a greater sense of responsibility for providing effective working conditions for people at home. I think that'd be fair to expect whether it's going to happen. I think depends on a lot of factors, but uh, I would I would hope to see that happen when going forward. Yeah, that's the, the legal side of that. Then, so there's a legal requirement for an employer to provide a workspace for an employee. But what about in a situation like this where? bringing that employee to the workspace puts that employee at risk potentially especially in areas where you know the, the greater um, transmission rates with the virus and so on um, so can the employer turn around and say well legally by providing them with an online platform that's their workspace and that's our obligation fulfilled I think uh, well I don't know the answer to that but I think okay. we certainly are in a gray area right because uh, um... And that's that's these are the types of questions we haven't been, we haven't been asking ourselves until now because you were supposed to do your work from home, at work and if you were in your free time to deciding to do otherwise uh, that then the responsibility wasn't yourself but if you're working um much more from home of course that starts to change yeah okay um and Rajesh, i'm going to come to you with this one from yase who asks how will organizational designs and management models need to evolve in order to ensure businesses can keep running effectively in a remote working world so how are models and approaches changing as far as you can see it yeah so i've been conducting some research on how uh, people are adapting to work from home and how it relates to their relationship with technology and and to the extent to which they have the sense that their use of technology is problematic, it stresses them out when they are moved into a work from home setting. And what that means then, I think for the future for organizations, they need to think very carefully about how we can get everyone up to speed to be prepared to be working from home. Uh, it's gonna be mixed across the workforce and um, it might be that newer employees, we need training programs to ensure that they are equipped to work from home for the technology and products and those kinds of things that Anna mentioned, um, but also just having the training of knowing how to separate and how to maintain that social connection with your coworkers. So I think the, the biggest thing that I foresee in the near future is just having some, in, in a way to onload uh, workers, train them to prepare for this work from home situation. Mm, okay. Uh, and Pellin, uh, Susanna asks, how, how is privacy going to be regulated for online remote working tools? Uh, and I guess regulation, that's quite a, a big issue because I suppose it taps into existing employment legislation, but also data protection and digital related privacy regulation. So, I mean, do we know how regulated this space is or indeed how that regulation should evolve to take account of these new ways that we're evolving of working? So I think uh, a lot of that work will have to happen as we are living through this reality, like the work conditions. So we'll see a lot of uh, movement there as well. I can speak a little bit about regulation uh, in relation to online uh, and, and freelance work. Uh, in that area, people have been speaking about regulation for a number of years now because gig economy in general, but also crowd employment platforms are probably the least regulated forms of uh, markets that we are uh, seeing in the world. And regulation is a must, but it's not, it's not the only solution. I think we need to think about work in a much broader and in the context of mac macroeconomic uh, settings. What kind of work do, do we want? What 
uh, level of employment do we want? Are we talking about full employment? How much unemployment is tolerated? Because those things moderate what self uh, what, what self employment will also look like, and what the work circumstances of the self employed will look like. Right. Yeah. So it really is taking a whole look at what we want from the economy, asking those big macroeconomic questions. And exactly. We, I, I don't think it's detached from those very important questions, which are being, uh, I think, decided at the societal level uh, in response to the COVID crisis. OK, right. Well, so this is an Imperial Late event. We're halfway through, by the way. It's it's half past seven UK time for those watching you live. We're very glad you're here, by the way. And it's great being in the moment doing it live as well. But if you're watching the recording, well, that's just as good. Um, so we're about halfway through. So we still want your questions. It's so easy. Just type them out in the uh, comments section and they'll end up in front of me. So uh, you've got half an hour. So get thinking of questions. And you've got three top experts here, folks. So don't pass this opportunity up. That's one thing you can't do on the recording, is it? So if you're watching live, make the most of it and join in. And Rushab certainly is. So Rushab actually come up with a follow up question. And this one comes to you, Anna, because you've become almost our water cooler moment correspondent here. So yeah, I keep coming to you for those questions about interactions in the office. And Rushab, I think, makes a really good point, saying that actually Rushab is finding it easier to work from home because I'm introverted. I can also take breaks from work when I want without feeling self-conscious. So we have to remember there's probably at least half the workforce actually rather cringes at the thought of those water cooler moments. You get stuck in some space where you've got to be extrovert and, and outgoing. There are many introverts who think, oh, I, I don't like that at work, actually. That freaks me out. So um, so how can we um, take that into account? Yeah, that's a, that's a great follow-up question. Um, I can actually relate to it myself quite well because I'm a, an introvert. Um, and I always say this uh, as very first thing when I teach uh, my MBA elective course, which is called strategic networking. So I say, well, isn't it strange that a person that is himself an introvert teaches a course about networking? Um, and actually, I say it's not because we all find in our own ways, uh, um, ways to engage with our colleagues at work. And so uh, some of us uh, may really quite um, fear or dislike uh, those talks to strangers that you don't really know very well um, at the water cooler. Um, at the same time, we almost all find moments in our working day to chat with another colleague or friend, to have a little chat. Um, and so we can do it in many different ways. It doesn't have to be this sort of intimidating. You have to go and approach a person that you don't really know. Um, of course, there's a certain comfort for people who are more introverted. Uh, it's easier to stay away from those moments when you're working from home. At the same time, there's probably other types of social interactions that you would normally have at work that are uh, that you're currently missing out on um, that are equally uh, probably important, uh, well, just as a nice thing to have as part of your working routine, uh, but they're also quite important um, for your effectiveness at work. Um, and so one of them uh, that certainly works typically for introverts is to go for lunch with colleagues they know relatively well. And so also at lunch, um, you typically don't talk alone, only about work or there's actually an opportunity to say, well, I've been having this problem. What do you think? How could I solve it? Uh, that's not something you quite so easily do from home. Um, it's not a water cooler moment. It's perhaps something that introverts do can quite as well. And sometimes I would say even better uh, because introverts are great at building rapport with people uh, once they know them a little bit better. Um, so I would say, also introverts probably in the longer term are losing out from being too much online. Yeah, and, and I've spoken to, to some introverts who say actually they find online working even more stressful because they feel actually the work environment is now invading their home. You know, the home is meant to be your safe space where you can shut the door on all those work colleagues and leave them over there in the workplace and then come and escape from them at home. And when you're having Zoom meetings right up into the you know mid to late evening, God, it's no escape, say some introverts. Um, so uh, anyway, really interesting to get into the personality type. So we'll go back to some more audience questions. But Rajesh, I do want to come to you because I really am very aware of not making this discussion just about office working because we know there are many many other sectors out there that are changing their working practices or are being affected economically by what's going on so what else should we be taking into account what other sectors are you looking at as you look at the the future of work yeah so i think on the consumer behavior side of course we're most interested in what's going to happen to tourism and hospitality these sectors are being affected so much in the current moment and it's affecting just the economics of it in the immediate future, 
that we have concerns about how will these sectors rebound in the next five years and beyond. Um, what you see though is overall, the trends have always been with these two sectors that things were growing. More and more people were before COVID going to restaurants and traveling uh, and now there's a sudden decline. Um, but I expect that things will rebound because so much of the reason for that demand is, is structural about how many more people all over the world are now uh, able to afford holidays and able to afford going out for nice meals. So I'm, I'm so optimistic on the whole, but I think it will be shaped differently for reasons, for instance, that Penland mentioned about this idea that people will be traveling less for work uh, globally in terms of flights. That changes that sector tremendously, changes the economics of, of uh, putting on an airline and, and actually running even a single flight. So much depends on that business travel. Uh, so I think these kinds of sectors are gonna be affected as knock-on of the whole work from home situation. Yeah, and in fact, we've had one question about virtual reality. Daniela says, can we use virtual reality to socially distance but still connect with others? So we're talking about tech fixes and less flying there. Are you looking into that at all, Rajesh? You know, wearing your marketing hat, for instance, are we seeing a lot of mm. VR companies or Microsoft with its HoloLens saying, well, this is our opportunity, we're jumping in. <laughs> What's going on there? Yeah, so at least in the last few years, what you've seen with VR and consumer response to that, and we probably expect something similar um, at organizations, uh, virtual reality headsets limited use in part because of the discomfort of, of wearing a headset and for any length of time. But AR is coming on quite strong in a lot of sectors. And in marketing, it's, it's now a big thing, uh, thinking about the retail space, the high street store and using augmented reality there. So I could ex see that coming on quicker than virtual reality, but we might see virtual reality in quite niche sectors, for instance, training programs for um, how to navigate a space or engineering works, those kinds of things. But in the office, AR could really change things. It could make us feel much more connected to our coworkers and understand information much better if it's coming at us from different dimensions. Uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun and be much more engaging, uh, but it hasn't taken off just yet. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know. I always feel like that about with VR, like that with VR and AR. In in some sectors, it's still yet to take off and find its place. But in the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College, I know that a lot of medical training before lockdown was going on uh, using HoloLens, augmented reality. And in in fact, since the lockdown started, uh, they were able to do patient consultations where you can only have one uh, doctor at the uh, bedside and HoloLens help there. So lots of stuff to get into there. But I digress because I want to. To, uh, come to you now, Pellin, with this one. It's from it's an anonymous questioner who says a lot of industries have shown that they're able to adapt to work re work remotely quickly to work remote working quickly, but how long until we see a knock on impact on employee welfare and well being? Question from Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. Anonymous. Okay, so I, I assume there is no room for clarification uh, there. But uh, I'm just wondering if they are, uh, because we don't exactly know how this will affect well-being. It could be quite positive and negative, depending on how things evolve. And I think it's still early days. Um, and it very much depends on the response of different sectors. Uh, what I predict we will see is, I think, sectors that invest into people, into uh, innovation, we'll see them do quite well. And I think their employees will end up doing quite well. But we will also, um, depending on how things go, we might see a decline in uh, confidence, the business in, uh, confidence in the business environment. And there could be a situation where companies don't invest as much. And we have seen this since the financial crisis in a lot of countries, including the UK. So in that situation, it could have quite negative implications for the workforce. And you'd like to think that um, industries would make the most of maybe some of the surveillance aspects of this, if you like, always on um, freelance working culture. I mean, it can go, I suppose, in in a number of ways. The, the bad way of it going is true surveillance and just really stressful, always on 
yeah, just hideous sense that you're always falling short of your targets and you feel disempowered and horrible. But you'd like to think that that same technology can deliver welfare benefits in terms of monitoring, I don't know, stress levels or if somebody looks tired or, um, I don't know, using some kind of deep learning algorithms to notice if somebody's voice is sounding strained in meetings. There's a lot we can do now or integrating with uh, body-worn technology like Fitbits and other um, devices to really just get up to the minute data about how people are doing and I'd like to think maybe it's good for business if that um, I don't know maybe I shouldn't use it use the word surveillance but that monitoring culture can be used in a in a beneficial way and not as some way of just checking up on people and just squeezing every last drop of productivity out of them. Exactly and Technology on its own can be thought as quite neutral. How we use it can be quite political. And uh, I think it is a piece of technology and how we use it for the benefit of whom is a very different question. Uh, I've got some great colleagues and we've got some great students at the Dyson School doing exactly what you're doing, uh, what you're talking about, using wearables to detect uh, anxiety responses. So that could be done, that could be beneficial. Obviously quite uh, delicate areas because these relate to very personal data that needs to be handled with care and the implications and the design of such technologies need to be thought out very uh, carefully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad we had that chat earlier on about um, augmented reality and virtual reality because Sheldon wants us to get into that. So please discuss the current state of R&D of AR and VR. So um, Sheldon, that went out to you. <laughs> but I'm going to come back to you, Anna, with this one that's just come in live uh, from one of our audience watching right now here on YouTube, who went into the comment section, posted us a question. You still have 20 minutes to do that, folks. So don't miss out. Um, this question from Lewis, in the longer term, for the younger generation, Anna, will people simply be more enticed to have careers that can thrive in a working from home culture? whilst other industries perhaps are starved of talent. So how's that going to go with younger people? I think uh, that's a very intriguing question. I think, although I'm, I don't know the answer to it, I would, what I was going to say, we could also be exactly the other way around. I think uh, when we look at our own students, um, they were really keen to have uh, quite a lot of clarity on having some face-to-face -face component to their study experience. Um, and I think the same will be true for people uh, starting their first jobs. I think, uh, unfortunately, there must have been many people who have started their first jobs working from home. I think it must be incredibly difficult uh, not knowing your colleagues uh, face to face. Um, what we know from research is that maintaining an existing relationship online is actually quite easy. But starting new ones is one of the most mm. difficult tasks we can do online. Um, the advice I always give to my students, whenever you find or start a new job is to uh, not fill your schedule with uh, too many activities from the start but to keep that slack in there right to keep these moments in which natural conversations can evolve and uh, where the space for relationships to grow um so i'd rather say the exact opposite uh, to what lewis was suggesting is that uh, i think industries that uh, will grow a healthy balance between having the flexibility of uh, working from home when possible, but at the same time, the certainty that there is a social aspect uh, to work that involves hanging out with colleagues, um, I think those industries will certainly be more appealing to the younger generation and those that are entirely online. Okay, uh, and that really taps quite nicely into a question from Marissa, and I'm going to put this question to all three of you, because I think you'll all have something interesting to say. Marissa asks, how can we keep the social relations with colleagues? And I'm going to interpret that question, Anna, the thing as you're speaking at the moment, as, um, so those of us who uh, have been in physical workspaces and have ended up being um, socially distanced online, um, just how you keep those relationships going beyond maybe just sending a snarky email every other day, you know? So how, how do we just keep it sociable? I'll put that to all three of you, but first, Anna. I would say that's the, uh, the art of good networking. Um, so I, in my MBA class, I talk about this, uh, what well, we talk about, about this with the students um, a lot. Um, and let me start off by saying that by maintaining relationships, uh, you create a diverse network. And so today we think of careers, not as, well, perhaps 30, 40, 50 years ago, people would spend their entire career in one organization. 
today that most of us uh, move from one organization to another. And those who are able to maintain uh, connections from one employee uh, employer to the next, over, over time create a more diverse network, uh, which is a great asset to have. Uh, the question is, well, how do you do that? Um, mm. And so one, one of the, the maintaining is actually quite difficult because it does um, require some time and attention. Um, okay. But uh, so yeah, um, well, 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 too, well, let's well, leave that hanging and yeah. let, let um, Rajesh have a go then. So, so Rajesh, how, how do we keep yeah. those relationships going? So I, my perspective is more, much more about those touch points that you have. So having that initial touch point, if you're going to have remote work and we're probably going to have a workforce that could be distributed in different geographies. Uh, having that at least, let's say, a week of induction with each other when you start or having other touch points throughout the year, I think we can all think of good friends or relatives that we have that we still feel close to because of those face-to-face -to -face touch points. Um, so the organizations need to think more about that as we move away from the day-to-day -day always meeting each other. And, and Pellin, how about you then? Keeping those working relationships going so we're not all strangers at that point when we do manage to get back to the workplace. Maybe I'll reflect uh, on the self-employment part of things. I think for the self-employed, there is a big world out there that they could reach out to whoever they like. And there is an opportunity uh, during times like this that they could reach out to really interesting people have conversations. It's a lot easier to have that half hour chat. And uh, I think people have responded to those kinds of requests really positively during this time. So I've been hearing from many people who have uh, built relationships with people they had not met before in person and they still haven't met under these circumstances, but have received some great advice, mentorship uh, and even connections. So I think it is, Definitely, there is a lot of work to be done within the organization, but there is an opportunity beyond the organization as well. Okay. And extending on from that, Chris asks, how does the culture of an organization change over time in a virtual world? As new people join an organization, how do you instill the organization's culture? So it's one thing doing it in, in the office and having the office laid out in a certain way and another thing achieving that through online platforms. I feel as if this might be one probably for well, all three of you, but I'm going to go to Anna and I've got a feeling Rajesh might want to come in on it. But uh, Anna, what, what do you make of that? How you, I suppose, um, transmute, if that's a word, <laughs> an organization's culture and make it as alive as it were um, virtually. And that's from Chris. Well, my answer to that would be that uh, I, I think organizational cultures are created and shared through socialization. And I think socialization can happen online as well. So I know about organizations who had uh, their away days, actually, everybody from home, where everybody was sent a, um, uh, a set of ingredients and they were baking a cake uh, all online. Uh, it's, just, it's a random example, but I think uh, socialization, and particularly in times in which we couldn't meet, uh, it can still be done online. It's a great way of making people feel part of the organization uh, to informally get to know one another. Uh, those are great ways uh, for organizational cultures to grow and to um, diffuse. That's a nice example. So Rajesh, have you got anything to add to that then? Just how, especially yeah, people so joining an organization and they don't get to meet their colleagues in real life as it were, maybe until quite a long time into the job. I think we can learn a lot from uh, other fields like gaming and how you can create a sense of social connection in a in a game like uh, a real life game kind of uh, virtual world. Uh, can we incorporate more of that into organizations in the future? I think it seems a little bit uh, out of the box, but it could actually do quite a lot for organizations if they use those kinds of gaming situations, even briefly to uh, create a space for employees. That might be one thing that will change in the long term. I think there'll be some resistance to that in the immediate future. But for now, I think having at least some um, form of social connection that is not just about work, that it relates to things like the interests like Ann was saying, that we normally would have at work, we eat together, we go to the pub or whatever your social activity might be in your organization. Can we translate that into virtual uh, setting, I think that's for every organization to figure out what works for their culture. 
Mm, yeah, and maybe thinking through what that culture is first. You know, who are we? What's our identity? How should people feel about working for this organisation? And and factoring that into how you design the online environment. Um, Oliver, and I think this might be a good one for you, Pellin. Oliver asks, what might be the impact of new working models on specific timing of the workday, uh, like nine to five, impact on hours worked per week? So really, it comes down to the quantity of hours worked and when those hours are, and, and maybe even at these initial stages of your research into freelance culture, if you're getting an, any idea of what we know about working hours and how they affect people and their welfare and the way that they work. So working hours is an interesting area. Uh, and so we work five days a week. We've got the weekends. That hasn't always been the case. Weekends uh, are an innovation uh, in history. And UK works some of the longest hours in Europe. So there has been, you may have heard during the, um, during the lockdown, there has been talk of um, four day week uh, weeks and then th this movement has been in place for a while so I think we need to think about how many hours people should be working what is what, what should be the norm of course you cannot force people to work for less work less but um, too much work obviously is not great and a balance between work and life is a, is a good thing. So that's a very complex question, but we need to think about how many hours we need to be working in order to start finding answers to that. Okay, yeah. Um, now, um, Kimberly has um, taken us out of the office and onto the construction site with this question. I'm going to come to you, Rajesh, with this one. Can construction-related work conducted remotely, in other words, having less human labour, be replaced with robotics, maybe more prefabrication. It might be outside your purview, but just because we were chatting away about virtual reality and that kind of remoteness. Um, yeah, just acknowledging that there are people who have in situ jobs, as it were, who can't just spend all day on a Teams meeting. Can you see anything in the construction industry from all this? Yeah, so this is not, I don't know the technology in the construction industry that would enable that. Uh, I think these things will grow if there are the economic reasons for it. I don't expect it to come out of just this idea of social distancing in construction sites. Um, but there are a lot of developments in robotics, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see changes in that way. Uh, it has to do with, will we be seeing a replacement of human workers with, with robots in a lot of different sectors, including construction? Uh, and I think each industry is gonna have a different pace for that. And, and so I don't know the specifics on construction, so I don't think I can answer that one. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Okay. But quite, it's quite an interesting opportunity to think about how just so many sectors are going to be restructured and, and reorganised. So we'll have to come back in a few years and see uh, how construction sites uh, look different. Um, so we're going to be wrapping up quite soon, folks. So probably time just to sneak a few more in. And I'll do a few kind of wrapping up questions just to ease us out of this and uh, into, the, uh, into the evening. Um, but um, uh, Dax wants to know how necessary offices are for startups or these days, can they just be run from a website? And I guess the implications there are like technology startups and digital agencies and that kind of thing. Um, so I can see you nodding there, Anna, possibly. So let, let's pick on you for a bit then. What, what do you think then? Uh, do startups, they, they can just get going without ever even needing an office, can't they? I would say uh, quite the opposite. If you uh, think about the trend uh, just up until the start of the pandemic, it was towards the use of co-working spaces, uh, incubators, accelerators. As startups, they want to be in each other's vicinity, in an entrepreneurial ecosystem or in these kinds of structures and co-working spaces uh, because they believe they can learn from one another. Uh, they get energy from one another. Uh, they get advice. Um, at my research in the London Entrepreneurial Ecosystem shows, that entrepreneurs are drawn to London uh, exactly for that reason, to be part of a bigger thing. Uh, because if you're an entrepreneur, it's a, it's a very solitary activity. And uh, it's in those circumstances that all the more you need to be amongst like-minded others. Um, and so the trend towards the greater use of accelerators, incubators, and co-working spaces has been temporarily stopped uh, because of uh, higher forces. Uh, but my um, expectation is uh, that it's going to come back, uh, perhaps at... Uh, uh, even stronger than before. Yeah, 
that's great. And that's been your whole big point this evening, that the physical workspace does matter, uh, where even in, in, and maybe especially in digital related startup kind of industries, it's still about having that physical workplace. Um, uh, Pelin, forget, forgive me, Pelin, for banging on about construction all the time, but it does occur to me that you've, you've in wearing your other hat, looking at the environmental aspects of economic activity that you might have looked at construction. I'm just throwing it out there, but if there's anything you can add about what we know about the environmental aspects here. Um, so speaking about technology, we see quite a lot of uh, positive impact of sensing technologies on construction sites, uh, making places safer for people to work because safety is a major issue on construction sites, but also uh, making things environmentally much, much better. Uh, so uh, things like uh, actually um, knowing where things move on a construction site uh, or uh, making um, making sure when we know when cement uh, forms etc those kinds of things are really important from an environmental perspective and innovation really does help uh, in that area and we might be able to uh, we might be able to see these help people transition into working more remotely even in those areas we don't think that is easy to do Okay, that's really interesting. Um, so a couple of final questions I'm going to put to all of you and then we're going to be out of here because uh, Rania asks, is there a chance that human work will become obsolete? So almost like a Twitter length answer for all of you. I think because that's, let's, let's not beat about the bush here. Many of us are worried about being replaced by an AI within five years. So reassure or not reassure us as you will. Pellin, as soon as you're talking, let's pick on you first then. Humans becoming obsolete? Um well, it depends how we use uh, AI. We could we could turn it into a positive thing that people will get more time that they can spend uh, with their families at home, working wherever they like, etc., and enjoy doing meaningful work. But we can also go very wrong. But I don't see it being okay. right. So Rajesh then, a dystopian future where the machines just take over and the whole question of humans and workplaces is, is entirely academic because it'll all be replaced by... Yeah, so, so this is a distant kind of technology and usually with these distant technologies, what you find is people overestimate how soon something will come and will change things and they expect rapid changes. Uh, but they, so it actually may take much, much longer to get to that point but they also underestimate how big of an impact this could have. So I don't know how soon it will be. It could be 200 years from now, but when it does happen, it will fundamentally change everything about work if we really get to that level of AI. Okay, and Anna, how about you then? Are we all gonna be replaced by machines anytime soon? Uh, not anytime soon, I'm sure, and perhaps not even uh, much, much further in the future. Um, I think um, what, what will uh, certainly, AI and other technologies will transform the way we work, uh, but perhaps in ways we cannot really anticipate. We've been talking about, so for example, when internet was first invented, we already started to talk about we're all going to work from home. Uh, well, it took a pandemic to really for us to start doing that. Um, and uh, as soon as these hard times are over, I think a lot of things will turn back to how they were before with some changes, definitely, um, but they're not gonna, machines are not gonna replace us anytime soon, I don't think. All right. And then final question. This is from RH. So, Anna, um, when COVID-19 draws to an end, finally, um, would you predict office work to return either partially or fully? Are we just going to settle into a more hybridized model in the future when, when we're out of the crisis? I think that's a very great way to wrap it up. I think um, the pandemic has opened our eyes that a more flexible approach to work is possible. Some things can be done from home. Uh, some things are better done from home and gives us a great flexibility. Um, but there's very important aspects of work, and my focus is on office work, um, uh, that uh, are better done in physical uh, proximity to colleagues, and we shouldn't uh, throw these out with the bathwater and move to an entirely online world uh, because we're uh, about to lose a lot if we uh, commit to that too, too much, if we get rid of offices altogether. 
Right, okay, so it'll be a hybrid for now. And and I think I can see Rajesh and Pelin nodding. So I'm gonna take that as assent, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. But what I do have to say is that we need to be out of here. Would you believe it? That is it for this evening, but don't go quite yet because I should just tell you uh, that um, we are going to uh, carry on with these online lates. Uh, so we'd love to know what you think about them. Uh, fill in the uh, evaluation survey, if you will, please. We'd like that very much. Uh, you can see it down there um, in the uh, YouTube feed and um, that's in the YouTube chat so tell us what you think and that's really really useful I promise you and um, the recording of this session will soon be available as well so share it with your friends or come back and watch it all again because you're bound to catch things next time that you didn't catch this time really sorry if we didn't get around to answering all your questions but I did my best to get uh, through as many as we possibly could uh, so um, on that I'm going to bid you a fond farewell thank you very much to Anna Rajesh and Pelin for being absolutely brilliant panelists and most of all, thank you, audience, for being here tonight. I'm Gareth Mitchell signing off. Goodbye.